Hello and welcome back to another KCC video. I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we're jumping into some malicious compliance. Our first story today comes to us from Loopy Legend, Tales of the Airport Parking Attendant. Let's jump right in. I used to work parking control at a busy airport in Australia. I can tell you stories from those days and after telling my friend a few, he said to put this on here as he thinks all you people in Reddit land might enjoy a good laugh. This one is called, Two Supervisors Tell Me Not To Listen To Each Other? Okay. So a little bit of background on how this job works. I used to work parking control at the big airport. It has one domestic and one international part to the airport, about five minutes apart via shuttle bus. I was the guy who told you which taxi was yours to move on if you spent too long at the drop off or quick pickup zone kiss and ride in Australia, where the Ubers were, covered control in the multi-level car parks and more. This particular day I was on the kiss and ride section or as we call it row D at the domestic airport. Cars were allowed to pull up and quickly drop off or pick up people. If cars stayed longer than a few minutes I had to move them on, normally to do a lap around the airport or go to the nearby McDonald's to wait for their relatives to call them, so others could pick up their relatives. Due to the nature of how big the airports are, we normally have three supervisors or managers on at any one time. One for the domestic, one for the international, and one in the control room. Everyone was on radio networks, separate for each airport. The supervisor on domestic that night we shall call Dewey, and the one in the control room we shall call Huey. I was about four hours into my eight hour shift, patrolling all of row D when Dewey walked up to me and asked me to cover taxi rank for a while. Some people had been rotated around as we got someone leaving early due to being sick. Hey, no problem Dewey. So I went to taxi rank. About 20 minutes into taxi rank, I get a call over the radio asking why I wasn't on row D from Huey in the control room. I explained that Dewey asked me to do taxi rank Huey said he needs me back on row D now. I ask was no one on row D? To which I find out no. So off I went back to row D as Huey told me someone would soon arrive to do taxi. Another 20 minutes later on row D, Dewey comes back in person and asks what the F am I doing here? Why ain't I doing taxi? I explained that Huey asked me to. Dewey told me not to listen to Huey. He is in charge on the ground at domestic, so I do what he says. I hesitated a little, but did as I was told, back to taxi I went. Now I look back on things and I think at this point Dewey's radio was down, low battery. This happens from time to time, and you don't always notice as you just think things might be quiet. I say this as, surely Dewey heard Huey over the radio order me back to taxi. Like clockwork, about 30 minutes later, Huey was right up my butt over the radio asking why I left Road D. I told him Dewey told me to do taxi. I was cut off when Huey told me not to listen to what Dewey said. He was in charge and if I don't listen to Huey I would be written up. If I mention another word about Dewey or the taxi rank I would be written up. Okay so back to road D I went again. By now I only had about one and a half hours left on my shift and I was looking forward to going home after this day. Again, Dewey found me on row D and demanded to know why I wouldn't follow his orders and wasn't at taxi rank. He said Josh, not real name, was there and it was supposed to be me on taxi. So he came to find me. I tried to explain what Huey told me, but upon hearing Huey's name, Dewey was having none of it. He told me to go to taxi and not leave it again till the end of my shift or I would be fired. Figuring a write up isn't as bad as losing my job. I complied with Dewey and went back to taxi, again. And yep, you guessed it, only took Huey another 30 minutes to get on the radio and scream and threaten me for disobeying his orders. I have to get over to Road D right now or I won't need to worry about a write up. I thought to myself, screw this, both supervisors are having it out with each other and I'm the punching bag in the middle they are taking their anger out on. Both Huey and Dewey told me not to listen to the other, you got it. So I went to the airport food court and had myself a feed for my last hour of work before heading home. Yep, I snuck out of work and clocked off without either of those dumb ducks finding me, was not in the mood for that, turned my phone off as well as I'm not supposed to listen to orders from the other, right? When I got in the next day the manager was waiting for me with a smug Dewey standing next to him. 
Manager, Dewey, and I all shuffled into Manager's office. The manager proceeded to ask me what the hell I was thinking using the last hour of my shift to have a dinner break. I asked him, did he see the camera footage of me in the food court? Manager says yes, and again asked why. I told him both Huey and Dewey kept telling me to go to different locations last night, and if I didn't do what they told me, I would be fired. I told the manager Dewey wanted me on taxi, while Huey wanted me on row D. The manager looks puzzled for a second. He asked me if I was supposed to be at either taxi or row D, why was I in the food court? I told him in more detail this time, because Huey threatened to fire me if I didn't ignore Dewey, and Dewey would have my job if I didn't ignore Huey. So I did what I was told and ignored them both. Dewey cried foul saying I was lying. The manager asked Dewey to step out of his office. Dewey only did so after much protest. The manager asked me to tell him the full story, which I did. He then told me to have the rest of the day off. Sweet, long weekend for me, as it was Friday. When I got back to work on Tuesday, I found both Huey and Dewey were no longer employed at the airport. My friend Josh filled me in that both Huey and Dewey chucked a huge tantrum in protest of my allegations. The manager telling them that the security footage of me constantly moving locations and testimony from other employees convinced him I was telling the truth. Josh was in the break room near the manager's office and heard the whole thing go down before seeing Dewey storm out of the building, followed by Huey, who looked defeated. The manager told me the next time to call him instead of just taking a dinner break at the food court, but I wasn't in any trouble. Wish I could say the supervisors that replaced Huey and Dewey were better, but that might be a story for another time. Side note, Dewey's radio could have been out of battery, or he kept it turned off on purpose as to not hear Huey in his ear. Both Huey and Dewey had been at odds with each other for a few weeks over something. I can't remember what. Either way, his radio wasn't on. They got fired for it in the end, so I'm not complaining. Wait a minute, how can we have Huey and Dewey but no Louie? What's up with that? Oh wait, there it is in the comments. OP says that Louie's coming in another story later on. I'll keep my eyes open for that one. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our second story today comes to us from DV Email. Well, okay, if you're really, really sure, let's jump right in. In the mid-1980s, I worked at one of the two largest aluminum companies in the US as a machine automation programmer. I was sent to work on a set of machines in a factory in Alabama. This factory took in raw materials and produced gigantic rolls of sheet aluminum in a wide variety of alloys. This particular factory was an early adopter of the continuous draw electrical smelting method. If you haven't seen this in action, it's worth seeing as it's amazing. Basically, there's this smelting furnace in the floor running a bazillion kilowatts of furnace heating, and the smelting draw machine very slowly pulls up the ingot from the smelter. The raw ingots were rectangular in cross-section and weighed about 30,000 pounds each, 13,500 kilograms, when fully drawn from the furnace. These ingots were drawn from the furnace with this gigantic claw device, and they were very, very, very slowly transported from the furnace area to the stacking area over the course of a few hours. In the stacking area, there was this massive cradle thing that accepted the ingot in a vertical alignment and then very slowly rotated it over to a horizontal alignment. All of this was done very slowly. The factory is a union shop with lots of trades represented. I was considered management because I was not a part of any union and there were a lot of restrictions placed on me in the factory. I come from a union family, so I generally respected the restrictions that made sense and put up with the ones that didn't. My job was to work on the control software that was very slowly being phased in to replace the completely manual system of ingot and roll transport inside the factory. The union guys were all in favor of an automated system as ingot handling and roll handling were considered to be dangerous jobs. Our story begins one day when the ingot claw machine breaks down. There are about six or seven of these claws on a long oval track and you can't transport the ingots if the claw machine won't bite into the ingot coming up from the smelter. The entire production line in the factory goes offline when this machine goes down. The machinists take a look and tell the bosses that the line will be down for about 12 hours while they investigate the failure in the control board, manual relays. I'm sitting in the factory office which looks down over the smelting floor having a cup of coffee. 
I overhear a couple of the middle management types discussing how to get the line operating again. One of them, who I will call Idiot One, suggests that they could use a wire cable sling like you see on a log to lift the ingot from one location to another. Idiot One and Idiot Two discuss the merits of this for a while and then head down to the shop floor to implement this idea of incredible brilliance. Down on the shop floor, a screaming match ensues between the union guys and management. The guys working on the smelter all drop tools and walk off the site. Having filed a dispute with their steward, Idiot 1 and Idiot 2 then proceed to head over to the claw machine operator and tell him to rig up a cable hoist to move the ingots that are standing in the smelters. As the story goes from a conversation over beer later on with the claw machine operator, no, lifting these 30,000 pound ingots on a steel hoop is a bad idea. Well, we're telling you to do it. Okay, well, this is not going to turn out like you think. Look, I'm a darn college graduate in mechanical engineering, and I'm a senior manager here, and I'm telling you this will be fine. Okay, well, the cable is going to pull off of the hot aluminum and drop the ingot. No, the coefficient of friction is high enough that it will not drop. Just effing do what we're telling you, or you can just quit. Okay, let me get my shop steward over here to hear all this, and I'll do it. Then the shop steward comes over, hears the conversation, and gives the claw machine operator a long look. Okay, let me clear the shop floor out, and we'll move one ingot. The entire shop floor is cleared of personnel, and the claw machine operator does as he's told. One of the riggers sets up a steel cable hoist, and they snag it around an ingot. They put a little tension on it and fire off the siren to indicate that there's an ingot moving. They get the ingot up in the air and slowly moving out of the smelter. The cable bites deeply into the ingot and seems to hold. Then, someone notices that the cable seems to be cutting more and more deeply into the ingot. It begins peeling a huge shaving off one side, exactly like a knife peeling a curl off of a stick of butter. Then, of course, the ingot sways dangerously. The claw machine operator stops the machine and the ingot falls. 30,000 pounds of hot aluminum smashes into the concrete floor and topples over. The claw machine operator turns to the completely white-faced idiot too and says, That coefficient of friction you mentioned, that was for hot aluminum, right? Fallout. Company has to pay out and deal with a grievance from both the foundry and smelter guys and the claw machine operator. Idiot 1 is demoted and assigned to a role in the accounting unit. Idiot 2 is reassigned out of a factory role completely and sent to work reviewing technical documents, his dream of being a factory manager gone forever. And it takes almost a week to clean up and fix the shop floor before normal production can resume. Small insert, the ingots are transported inches above the floor, not way up in the air. So even though it dropped on the shop floor, it did so from a few inches. What caused the most damage, and probably the loudest sound I have ever heard, was when it toppled over and smacked down horizontally. Ah yes, idiots, they can be quite entertaining at times, you know, when they're not trying to get people killed. It still makes me wonder though how management who isn't normally on the floor will not take the advice of the people that do the job every day. As the worker though, sometimes you just have to do what you're told, sit back, and watch the world burn. Our last story today comes to us from Tokyo Flex. Remake the whole order? You got it. Let's jump right in. Worked at a crazy popular restaurant with a huge outdoor deck on the ocean. It was a river leading to the ocean, but as we said in the south at the time, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. This place was right next to the cruise ship terminal, so we literally watched thousands of people disembark and hundreds head for our restaurant at the same time. Needless to say, we'd be packed with a line out the door at these times. A group of six comes in, and we want to sit on the ocean. Okay, you and everybody else. I tell them it's a 30 to 45 minute wait unless they want to eat indoors, which is quicker. They grumble, but they can see we're swamped and begrudgingly accept the pager I give them, insisting they need to sit on the ocean. You're willing to wait, no worries. I inform them that ticket times right now are currently higher than normal, being that the cruise ship just dropped off hundreds of people. They say that's fine. Great, hang out over there and I'll buzz you. 20 minutes go by and a younger lady with long and curly red-headed hair from the group approaches me at the front desk, waving the pager around. 
Is this thing broken? This thing must be broken. We've been waiting an hour. Uh, no you haven't. We have an open table, a reservation system, that tracks your status in real time. I spin the computer around to show her that, in fact, you've been here literally 21 minutes, and you're gonna have to wait at least 10 to 20 more minutes. She throws a minor hissy fit in front of some of the other guests in the lobby, but they're definitely not on Team Merida. Back to the waiting area she goes. We get them sat at a picnic table on the front water prime real estate. It was about 40 minutes from when I quoted her, so I had five to spare. The rest of her group is happy with the spot and looks hungry and ready to order. I motion over their server, Leah, and say, let's get this order in quickly. Not good enough for her. She again complains that they waited an hour, nope, 40 minutes, and that they should get free appetizers at the very least. Now, me, I will always admit a mistake on our part and make it right, but we quoted her, gave her the best table possible, and still came in under time. This is business as usual, but sometimes I'm a nice guy and realize people are hangry, low blood sugar, and need some love. So I ask her, have you ever had she crab soup? She looks bewildered and shakes her head. I say, I'm gonna bring you some she crab soup. The group orders apps and entrees at the same time. Leah asks if they want her to bring it all together. No, no, they say, bring the apps first, then fire the entrees. Leah does just that, and it takes about 20 plus minutes for them to come up. Since we have a problem child, I run the apps personally, put fried green tomatoes, crab cakes, and of course, the delicious she crab soup on a tray. Run it out to them, drop the apps on the table, and like a scene in the Matrix, I watch one of Brave's curly red 10-inch hairs slow-mo fall from her own head into the bowl of soup I've just presented to her. She looks down and freaks the F out. Your hair is in this soup. This is disgusting. You need to remake this entire order. Y'all, I'm bald. I shave my head every day. You could pluck your eyebrows while looking at the back of my head. As gently as I can, I tell her I watched her own flowing, luxurious lock fall into the soup and insist it's not mine. She is in an outrage, calling me a liar and insisting that I did this on purpose because I didn't like her. Um, she demands I remake the entire order. The rest of the table is uncomfortable, sees she's in a mini rage world and insists it's fine. Let's just eat. Me? Nope. Yes, ma'am, and I scoop everything off the table onto my tray. Apps, beverages, plates, silverware. Let's start over, and hopefully we can get off on a new foot. By the way, I mentioned that ticket times were long, as the cruise ship just docked, so it may be a while to get a new course of appetizers to you. We'll do our best as busy as we are. I'll have some new beverages out to you as soon as Leah slows down. I go into my kitchen and tell my slammed sous chef Brian that I need a refire on that ticket, he is a loud and angry dude and initially screams at me, but on the plus side, he's also incredibly vindictive. So when I tell him this one's about sending a message, he smiles and puts the ticket at the end of the line. Two hours later, the table finished and left Leah a 30% tip. Guess who didn't pay the bill? Worst part of the story, she never got to try the she crab soup. I'm pretty sure a 30% tip is pretty darn good, but I think the other people at the table felt sorry for the treatment that the server got. I'm sure they were used to that with their friend, and it makes me wonder why they keep that person as a friend. But that's, I guess, a whole other question. Check out all three OPs linked in the description down below. I do thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.